Testing. Are you missing the football? Uh, it's over. <laughs> I will definitely finish before the football, don't worry. I have, well, I was going to say I have a lot more, but then I just, yeah, he probably had about four hours material. <laughs> he, did, he didn't know, though. He thought it was much shorter. Um, I'm going to start pretty much now. So if anyone's wondering, we're going to start. Um, okay, so um, my name's Adam Gibson, uh, also known as Waxwing on the Internet. Um, First thing I want to say is, although she's not here, thanks to Lisa and uh, Dulce and all the organizers for organizing this excellent event. It's, uh, it's proving to be really interesting for me and I think a lot of other people. Uh, what else do I want to say? Yeah, so uh, I, I, did, I, just, I just said thank you, Lisa, but uh, you weren't here. <laughs> um, but now you are, so that's great. So, uh, yes, yeah, um, this title's terrible, but, you know, what can I tell you? Uh, I'm not good at clickbait. Coin, well, I, I try to be a bit clickbaity. Coin join done right. I'm trying to claim that I've solved the problem, you know, which, let's face it, is ridiculous. Uh, I haven't, but uh, I suppose what I can say in a more serious way is that I'm proposing what I consider to be a meaningfully different alternative way of looking at the concept of coin join and therefore at the concept of on chain privacy because the conversation nowadays about on chain privacy is tends to be dominated by CoinJoin. Uh, the par parenthetical and anti-Sybil with Riddle, uh, given timing constraints, we'll see. I don't know how long this is going to take, but it might be that I don't really get onto that. I actually gave a presentation in San Salvador on that topic, which is on YouTube, so arguably it would be slightly redundant for me to do it again here, but it just depends. If we've got time and, and people are interested and they're not too hungry <laughs> for the last half an hour, maybe we'll talk about that as well. Um, but this first, this first thing is, is more like directly about, you know, what is the right on-chain privacy model? And, and, and Max this morning has given you like an excellent uh, sort of whirlwind tour of all the most basic and important concepts, like, like the, the ground zero of on-chain privacy, things about, you know, thinking about change outputs, thinking about address reuse and blah, blah, blah. And, um, and of course, we saw at the end, we saw at the end of that uh, an example of one of the most developed ideas that exists today about how to do coin join, right? Which is Wasabi, or Wabi Sabi, or Wab Wasabi 2.0. Um, so an outline of what I'm going to talk about, uh, it's kind of a bit skewed, because I'm mostly going to focus on those first three, those, yeah. those first three. So why do, do we need coin join? Why do we need it? What are the problems with it? And then my proposed alternative solution, which is, in quotes, coin join done right. Uh, this first part I'm going to skip through because honestly, even if I had more time, it might be a bit boring. I'm, I'm just sort of philosoph philosophizing about what I think about this stuff, what I've thought about this stuff for, I guess, 10 years now, um, which is that, you know, I don't see on-chain Bitcoin as a consumer payments network, and I think anyone who thinks it is just misunderstood it, and that could even include Satoshi, shock horror, who talked about vending machines. Uh, I think it's just not the right characterization of what the system actually is. Uh, uh, it's it's a more like a hard money system, um, which means I've sometimes used the phrase it's uh, where is it there Swift not Starbucks points you know and I've sometimes said to people Bitcoin is financial plutonium or, or uranium which is my way of saying to this is dangerous stuff uh, if you're an engineer and you know what you're doing then you probably will be okay and if you're not you need to be very very careful you know uh, because there are things about it that are unobvious there are things about it that are very inconvenient, and um, if you let your impatience get the better of you, you've got a very good chance of losing your money, or perhaps, perhaps not losing your money, and then just being very having very bad privacy as well, which is obviously the topic of this conference. 
Um, and of course, just as a bit of a joke, I point out that if Bitcoin is financial plutonium, then uh, buying and selling on a, on a sex is, uh, is a financial anthrax, you know. And my, my point there is that, you know, if, if, you, if you're a nuclear engineer, you can, you can handle plutonium correctly. You know the, the procedures. But if you're handling anthrax on a daily basis, <laughs> eventually you're going to die, okay? So, so please avoid decentralized exchanges. Uh, it, it, this is not the right time to make that, that comment because everyone's... Uh, I should have been putting... Uh, Sam Bankman free there, of course, but uh, but I'm uh, I'm old, so there we go. Um, so I mean, the purpose of that first slide is just to emphasise that point. We're dealing with something that's difficult to do. You know, handling on-chain Bitcoin is difficult. I, I know it's it certainly wasn't it wasn't uh, accepted to say that back in the day. It's more accepted nowadays. I think people get it, be partly because a, a second layer exists. And you know, to come back to my point, consumer payments network on-chain Bitcoin, no. Consumer payments network, Lightning, maybe yes. You know, at least it's, it makes us an effort at doing that, being usable as a consumer payments network. But on-chain activity, fundamentally, I would argue, and it's maybe a little bit of a hot take on this slide, you know, is is a kind of a political act. Just even using on-chain Bitcoin at all, let alone using CoinJoin, which I think is a very kind of political act. And I've had many private conversations, including with people in this room. Uh, and many other sort of Bitcoin users who confide in me that they, they want to be virtuous and use coin joins like they're told. Use a, every spend a coin join, but actually they don't do it at all because they're really scared, right? Uh, and I don't blame them. Why wouldn't you be scared, right? Because you hear stories about the uh, coins getting blocked all the time. So, you know, you've you got to be sensible about these things. If this is money that actually matters to you and it's not just a toy, um, then you've got to be quite careful about what you're doing. So... I know that's a whole can of worms that I'm deliberately going to not unpack right now, but, but it, let's consider that framework that we're talking about a serious form of hard money which has a political component to using it. Uh, on the other hand, if we're talking about, if we're talking about something like um, lightning, we could say it's not a political act. I think I put that on this slide, or maybe the next one. Uh, anyway, I didn't. <laughs> but but, but I, I would say you know, making a lightning payment is not a political act. Maybe that's a weird thing to say. Like, if I make a payment with an on-chain on -chain Bitcoin, it's a political act. And if I make a payment with Lightning, it's not. I can't 100% defend that, defend that position, but maybe it gets your brain thinking about these issues. Um, blockchains are inherently public. Uh, we, as the on-chain privacy community, are, in some senses, trying to do something ridiculous and impossible, which is to make something which is inherently public be not public. Um, and of course, projects like Monero and Zcash uh, ex extend this further, right? They, they say, you know what? The very design of Bitcoin is not good enough for that. We need a design that is properly, intrinsically private. But I think embedded in that, they, they end up with sort of paradoxical situations. And uh, I remember in uh, building on Bitcoin in 2018, I was on a panel and I said, you know, Zcash is great and all, but uh, what if there's a, a bug which causes inflation, nobody will know. And then six months later, it came out that there was a bug which caused inflation, which nobody knew about, and which they had hidden for an entire year. So for six months before I was on that panel. So that was a kind of amusing experience for me. But uh, I think Peter Todd at the back of the room here is one of many people who pointed out before the event. Uh, and of course, he was involved in the creation of Zcash. He pointed out before the event that this, this is, a, is a fundamental kind of failure mode you have in such a system, which is unavoidable no matter how your, good your cryptography is claimed to be. Because the problem is not like, is the cryptography sound? Uh, the problem is um, in the flow from the brain of an academic to a paper, to an, an engineer, to another engineer, mistakes get made. You know, in building these systems, they are intrinsically very difficult to build. So that's why I say the DNA of blockchains is to be public and trying to make them not public, you, you kind of tie yourself up in knots a little bit. Um, I won't go through this text. You can read it later if you care. But yeah, I end with, I end with a lightning payment as an apolitical act as, as, as my sort of little punchline there, which, you know. And, uh, and also, make this is really, really cheeky of me and unfair, but this graph shows um, an attack that recently happened on Zcash in which somebody spammed their blockchain with... I don't know how many transactions it says there, does it? Millions, I guess. No, that's, what was it? Five transactions per block. Five transactions per block, which is, was it only five per block? Yeah, but it's created in a way that it shows up in the block. If I remember, 
Oh, I see. So they basically create full blocks. Okay, yeah. Well, whatever. The point is that, that some weird thing they had, I, I have no idea what the logic was, was we would have a fixed transaction fee per transaction. Maybe it was a privacy argument, which we'll come back to something we'll see later. A privacy argument that, oh, we should have a, a fixed transaction fee independent of the size of the transaction, which is just insane. Or, you know, and, and anyway, so at the end of the day, they were just spamming the, the block. And then I'm saying that, oh, look, um, the history of Zcash, uh, that is, so to speak, the nullifiers, which are a bit like key images, which I'll talk about later, uh, they have to accumulate infinitely because you've essentially got a state that can only increase in size because you can never delete state because you're deliberately obscuring the fact that a, that a particular coin has been spent. Um, so that's a kind of simplified summary of what's going on there. Uh, and I'm kind of like obfuscating the fact that that's not really the same thing on the graph and in the text, but they are kind of related. Like the more state you create in Zcash, the more of an issue it is that there's this infinite history which you can never prune. Um, maybe this is unfair. Maybe the cryptographers are going to come up with clever ways to deal with that. I'm not sure. I, I really don't know. But, but there's certainly big problems with taking this approach to privacy. But it is an obvious approach to privacy. Let's not, you know, let's not be a maxis who think that you know, anything which isn't Bitcoin is you know, the devil. We, we should at least look at these systems. And I, I, I have looked at some aspects of some of these systems. I find them very interesting. Um, anyway, so CoinJoin, as I said earlier, is the way we're tending to do things. And we've got, you know, let's, let's even forget about Join Market for a minute. Let's just say Wasabi, or let's just say Samurai. Pe people have this, I, uh, this idea that, um, and I think I might have, yeah, uh, this idea of make every spender CoinJoin is somehow the ideal. Um, if I said, I don't think we should make every spender CoinJoin, would you agree with me? And if so, what's, what's your thinking? Is, we'll put it this way, does anyone agree, uh, no, does anyone, I have to put it this way around, does anyone disagree with this statement, and if so, why? Peter Todd at the back there. Right. I, I would say, like, it's, it's okay that, you know, some users, like my open time stamps transactions, have technical reasons where coin joins just are a nuisance. And, you know, we, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't hate on the people who have reasonable reasons like that. But they certainly are niche. I'm just curious why, I mean, I can see a why, reason why you'd say we don't need coin join for open time stamps, but why would it be a nuisance? Well, because it makes transactions bigger, which makes the proofs bigger. Right, so it just makes it yeah. bigger, yeah. Also, so, that's a good reason, yeah. yeah. Also, like because I update the tip of the Merkle tree for all the timestamps every single block, you know how exactly you'd implement that with CoinJoin? It's not really tr like clear okay, how you so do it, it. So it's technically difficult, right? So, yeah. so I mean, I think the most important point coming out of that is just the the, the size question, right? I mean, as as Max correctly pointed out in his talk, um, CoinJoins most ways you'll do the, do them are going to increase the amount of space we use on the blockchain. So, I mean, we in, in Chris Belter and I in Join Market in the early days, and, and many other people, of course, realized that coin joins cool and all, but you can't have everyone doing equal output sized coin joins all the time. Uh, I think got another answer there, yeah. Yeah, I would guess also that when you're coin joining, you sadly are beholden to the best practices of the other people involved in the round. Yeah. And if everyone is just coin joining by default with no regard paid for the actual necessity of their own privacy, they might just recombine everything after. I mean, if everything is a coin mm -hmm. join, I don't know what that really looks like, but if you're not going to act in a way that preserves privacy and you're coin joining with people that actually need it, you might hurt them inadvertently. Yeah, yeah, that's a very important point about the fragility or brittleness of these uh, collaborative transactions, as people tend to call them nowadays, is that um, the fragility is that you can't assert the, the quality of privacy you get, because it depends on not only behavior before, which you can read on the blockchain, but behavior after of your counterparties. Um, so that's, very, that's a very problematic aspect. Um, I mean, feel free to offer any other answers if you, if you have any, no? I mean, there's obviously lots of answers to that, but um, I wanted to, this is debatable, but I wanted to illustrate what I think the, is how it's working today, which is that uh, people are using coin joins mostly in these systems uh, I mean, uh, Wasabi 2 already sort of invalidates some of the things I'm saying here, but in, in the centrally coordinated model, the idea is that you have to agree on an amount, and you know, <laughs> that's not really true of Wasabi 2. Well, it kind of is and isn't with Wasabi 2, but let's just say, you, you, because, because you're having a central coordinator, who gets to decide what the amount is, so therefore, 
uh, generally speaking, you have what they call fixed denominations. If you have fixed denominations, you're going to get a smoother experience because the central coordinator can handle a lot, handle, handle a lot of the nonsense. But the inability to choose an amount causes problems like, in quotes, toxic change. Um, on the other hand, if you go the other extreme like Join Market tried to do, you have a market-based system, you have to handle a lot of problems yourself as a user that otherwise would have been handled by the coordinator, such as civil attacks, or things similar to civil attacks. I won't go into details. And it makes the experience a lot less smooth. Um, and it also has a much bigger problem, which is an on-chain fee watermark. So if the fees are being paid from certain participants in the collaborative transaction to another participant because that participant is offering liquidity as a service, it means there's going to be a discrepancy in the... I'm not going into details, I'm just giving you like the high level idea that, that the, for example, the inputs of one party might be have more fee deducted from them than the inputs of other parties, which might make it easy for you to identify the inputs of the person who was paying for the service, as opposed to the people who were offering the service and getting paid. Um, I mentioned this recently in a, in, a, in a post on Mastodon, but it suddenly occurred to me, because I listened to a podcast by Shores Provost and Aaron Van Weerdem about the recent case of Alexei Pertsev, who was imprisoned in the Netherlands and not yet charged, I believe, but imprisoned for multiple months for being a coder for Tornado Cash or being part of the Tornado Cash team. And while we don't know the full details, it apparently is the case that the basis of the prosecution's keeping him in prison is mostly around the existence of a token called Torn or something, um, which, while is not directly inside the sort of tornado cash contract execution. It's inside like some relaying process. And why do, why do you have to relay transactions into the tornado cash uh, process? It turns out it's precisely because of on-chain fees. Because if you do this, uh, this anonymity process in their contract naively, the, the fact that you're paying a fee in, in Ethereum for the execution of the contract kind of somehow gives away who you were to begin with. So it's exactly the same issue that we, we, we often find ourselves stumbling if we try to make properly decentralized, properly uh, trustless versions of these co cooperative or collaborative transactions for privacy. We stumble over the fact that there's a fee uh, that has to be paid. And if it's being paid directly on chain, then it, we come back to that. The DNA of blockchains is to be public, right? Which means that you have a big problem. And that, that's part of what I'm going to try and solve in the, in the, in the remainder of my talk. Uh, let me keep track of time. Okay. In the remainder of my talk, uh, it's going to get very technical from now on. So I apologize in advance for people about that. Um, I'm not going to get into the question of economic incentive via cross-input signature aggregation. I defer you to Jonas Nick, who actually worked out the numbers. Uh, I just want to say that economic incentive for coin join via cross-input signature aggregation is a bit of a red herring, A, because the actual s amount of fee savings is quite minor, as according to the tables in that link, but also because uh, cross-input signature aggregation um, incentivizes transaction batching. Uh, well, coin join plus a uh, batched coin join, let's say, but it doesn't I it incentivize a specifically privacy-preserving coin join. And I'll let you, you just figure out that on your own later. So I want to introduce a new concept, which isn't actually new. Uh, I think I first talked about this in, 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 I'd already mentioned Lisbon in 2018, so it's four years ago now, more than four years ago. But only, I, I only introduced like the basic concept here, and I, I think it's developed significantly, at least in my head, <laughs> maybe not in actual code. Um, so can we make coin joins or things like coin joins, let's say collaborative privacy enhancing transactions that are Steganographic, and if you're not familiar with that term, it just means that, let's say they're coin joins that don't look like coin joins, so they're not obvious. You know? A coin swap, for example, has a steganographic property a little bit because you don't see an obvious pattern. You can't immediately recognize it on the blockchain. So steganographic, decentralized, because I, I think that the central points of failure is a big issue which we will continue to stumble against in this field. Market-based, because markets solve a coordination problem. So as was already mentioned this morning, the only really big advantage of join market is that one person can choose the denomination themselves. 
and coin joints, because coin joints. Because they're still kind of coin joints, but they also kind of aren't. So what the heck am I talking about? So start with the basic idea. Uh, and coin join XT. Now, the XT is just like a meme. It was funny four years ago. It's not funny anymore, but never mind. Um, so you can just think of it as extended coin join, OK? Because that's the, the non-meme aspect. Yeah, OK, maybe it wasn't funny four years ago either. But, but, but uh, yeah, coin join XT, basic idea. I, I know this is like crappy text diagram. Maybe you can't see it very well. Apologize for that. Um, stand up, can I? So um, uh, basically the idea is, okay, what does, how did SegWit change Bitcoin? Now, I'm not going to put this to the audience because you could answer that 10 ways, but, but, but the, mo the most important thing is for something like, think about something like Lightning. Anyone here who knows Lightning probably knows that why SegWit was important for Lightning is that it allowed you to pre-sign a transaction using an input that wasn't yet confirmed because you know the TX ID, the transaction ID of the transaction before it's on the blockchain. And why did that change in SegWit? Well, all right, let me throw that one to others. Why did SegWit allow us to pre-sign transactions? Yay. But it got rid of transaction malleability, which yeah. meant you, you couldn't fool the other party. And what caused transaction malleability? Uh, the witness data being a part of the transaction rather than being in yeah. a separate. And, and why, would it, why would it malleate? Why would that witness data malleate? Uh, because you can change trivially. I, I can't remember exactly what you can change about it, but you can create a new tr valid transaction that does the same thing, but with a different hash. And signature, signature, yeah. yeah. The, 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 the idea is that, and I, I guess it's kind of important for something else that comes up later, is that <clears throat> we sometimes forget that we, when we sign something with ECDSA or with Schnorr, we can always make a new signature with a new nonce, same private key. We can make effectively an infinite number of signatures. So that fact meant that Lightning didn't work without SegWit, but now the witness is outside the transaction ID. You can't malleate it, so you can pre-sign transactions. So the, the idea here is just to exploit the same thing, but instead of in Lightning, <coughs> you create multiple versions of the same transaction, and they kind of one overwrites the other with a punishment mechanism. Here, it's just I'm just I originally called this on-chain contracting. Well, let's just have a bunch of transactions, and they are all going to go on chain. So the idea here is um, there's a sequence, there's a funding UTI. Oh. There's a funding UTXO here that gets, you know, negotiated. Then the two parties agree on a sequence of transactions, which are all linked by at least one connecting UTXO, which is all have to, has to be multi-sig. And they're, all, they're, they're both, let's say it's two people, they're both going to have to sign, um, pre-sign every one of these transactions first before they co-sign the, the, the funding transaction. And that means that at the end of that process, they can both be assured. You know, if at least one of them wants to broadcast all of these transactions, they will definitely all go through because the connectors, the inputs, are multi-sigs, which can't be reneged on by the counterparty. And that means, what, why, why does that matter for coin join? Well, it means that, for example, here after TX1, so we had, we had Alice and Bob. Here after TX1, Bob can get a payout in TX1 without Alice also being paid something. So in, in a way, you know, Alice has lo lost out at this point, but all of these are, are pre-signed and they can't go anywhere else. So the idea is to <coughs> break heuristics by, by the fact that if uh, an analyst, chain anal uh, a chain surveillance expert <laughs> is looking at this transaction, they'll see a payment out there, but they won't see anything. Uh, it, will look like, it might look like an ordinary payment. I mean, the details we will see in a minute. It will depend on the details. Um, I kind of tried to explain that quickly. I wonder if people are getting it. Um, another thing that might help you understand it is, <coughs> suppose instead of just a pure sequence, we had an extra UTXO contributed by one of the counterparties here inside to that transaction. So this, this is a multi-sig from that transaction to that transaction, but there's another UTXO contributed by LS there. Is that safe? Is it still the case that we can be sure that TX4 will get broadcast? If this, if this UTXO is only controlled by Alice, now remember, none of these have been broadcast yet. We sign this, we sign this, we sign this, we sign this, and only finally do we sign this funding UTXO, or let's say create a transaction that pays into that funding UTXO, yeah? And then that, that transaction's on chain. So this UTXO exists. But all of this is just pre-signed by both parties. It's not on the blockchain yet. So is it safe to just contribute another UTXO? No, because Alice can never spend 
Right, so Alice, Alice could, could have given you a signature signing transaction three on UTXO A1, but could 10 minutes later spend UTXO A1 somewhere else, right? So that's not safe. So whenever we have something like that, we call that a promise UTXO. It's a promise, it's not a guarantee, yeah? So we need to create uh, time-locked back out refunds paying out of the transaction before it to make sure that if she does that, we can still get our money back. Does that make sense? So notice here, we started with a, a one and one, and yeah, so Alice contributed one, so at this point, Alice should get paid back one, but Bob should only get paid back 0 0.5 because he had an output in DX1. Um, any questions about this uh, structure? Because this will be extended in a minute. Yeah. Can Alice add that output after the first transaction was signed already? Or in other words, can, can we update the chain after we started it? I never thought about that. Um, what do you think? So hang on. Uh, no? No, no, because... We're signing here. W what does this arrow represent? It represents uh, a UTXO out of TX3 paying into TX4. What kind of UTXO is that? Correct, yeah. But anyway, it's a multi-sig on a specific TX ID, right? So we couldn't like, f unless you maybe sick hash single or some you know, dark arts that I don't understand. I don't think anyone ever used anyway. Uh, no, basically I'd always envisioned this as frozen in time. Uh, at the point where you finally, the, 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 the distinguishing decision is to, f is, to, is to sign that, or let's say sign the transaction that pays into that. Well, the person, yeah, it, it has to be that way around, yeah. Anyway, that's the basic idea, does that? Does that? Yeah, yeah, like I'm, Go on. I'm, I'm, so this is a, a, a chain of pre-signed transactions, but yeah. just like with yeah. Lightning, we can update. Right, the this is what I was saying at the start, is that Lightning is about, I, I like, uh, whimsically, I called it vertical contracting as opposed to horizontal contracting. Uh -huh. Yeah, because Lightning updates. And of course, intrinsically, updating is, is kind of stupid, right? Because that's, that does, doesn't, doesn't guarantee the previous one doesn't exist anymore. But the idea is there's a punishment mechanism or an L2 mechanism, blah, blah, blah. None of that here. This is just flat. You know, everything is signed up front and it's unlocked at the moment when you sign the funding UTXO. B but if both know. parties collaborate honestly, then they could. Oh still no! Yeah, yeah. It. Sorry. Yeah. If, if, of course. But that just that goes without saying, right? I mean, I'm just trying to yeah. design something that's safe from the other side cheating. Obviously, uh -huh. I put two here. Obviously, it could be ten people as well. By the way, it's this is designed for an n of n multi sig thing. So I don't mind spending time on this because, after all, I'm sure most people haven't e either haven't heard of this or didn't really look into it. So if there are other questions about this structure, I don't mind. I, I want to like make it way more complicated though. <laughs> Yeah, so how can I summarize it if you don't want to like get lost in the details? I want to summarize it by saying um, everything's pre-signed and the reason it's all locked in is precisely because the transfer of funds is on a multi-sig controlled by all parties. Otherwise, it wouldn't be safe, right? Well, no, 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 but that's, that's, that's why this is very, it's a very bare bones illustration. But for example, in TX1, there's an extra payout to one of the parties. So naively, you look at it and think, well, this isn't safe because Bob's getting a whole lo a load of money before Alice got anything. But that's why everything has to be frozen and locked at the start. And, that, and by achieving that goal, it means we can break the typical heuristics because it doesn't look right. That looks like there's an actual payment there. But anyway, I think it's more, more clear on the next slide, actually. Um, where's my... Yeah, so this is, I, I call this the kitchen sink. So I'm, I'm extending this idea a bit, all right? So here, there is a key. So green is multi-sig between the parties, I think, yeah. In he, here it's also only two. <coughs> well, it's only two in the multi-sig. <coughs> so here we have both Alice and Carol funding the multi-sig initially. Uh, but the idea is we could also embed two other types of event inside this network. I mean, I'm showing it as a very bare bones straight line, but imagine it could also branch off. It works, you know. It's the same principle. Um, the first thing we embed is a pay join. 
Well, okay, let me, let me describe the scenario. The scenario is Alice wants to make a simple payment to Bob, who is not around. She wants to pay Bob one Bitcoin. And uh, Carol wants to pay David two Bitcoins, but he is around, he's online, and they agree to pay join it. Because that's better for privacy, right? I mean, you've probably... I'm assuming everyone here knows what pay join is. Uh, maybe not, I don't know. Um, so where's the pay join? Can, can you... Can anybody tell me where the pay join is? Sorry. <laughs> Sorry about the camera thing. Can anybody tell me where the pay join is? Is, is that Sean, is it? Yeah, couldn't you? A uh, collaborative spin between two parties? Yeah, no, no. I'm, yes, that's what a page on is, but, what, that's, but where is the page on on this diagram? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry, slightly harder question <laughs> than what is a page on. <laughs> so I'll repeat that Alice wanted to pay Bob one Bitcoin. Bob's not around, so it's, he's, you know. Uh, but Carol wants to pay David two Bitcoins in a pay join, and he has to be around to do the pay join. So where's the, where's the pay join? Yes, Max? Right? Yep. It's clear. It's, I actually write it really easy because there's a D there, right? <laughs> so David, David's there, right? He's receiving 2.5, but he's also contributing 0 0.5 into that specific transaction. Now, what kind of UTXO is that? Who can read? What kind of UTXO is the 0 0.5 from David? It's a promise UTXO. That's right. Why is it a promise UTXO, Lisa? Because it's got a red arrow. <laughs> But what, 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 uh, why, what's the negative about a promise you take? So it's not part of a multi-sig. It's, it's coming from outside of the, of the tree, so to speak, or the, the line. Um, but what's, what's the danger? Why is it red for danger? <laughs> if somebody could double spend it and break the rest of the chain, right? Yeah, so what do we have to do to uh, address that, that danger? Hmm? Well, David's just like gonna. He wants. To, he's happy to accept a payment of two bitcoins from from Carol, but he he just wants to do a pay join with her. Maybe he's got a BTC Pay server. He doesn't want to do all this rubbish, you know. He doesn't care about the rest of the tree. What what do we do? Yeah. I mean, with pay join, you have a pre-signed single user transaction. Yeah, but that wouldn't help stop the double spend problem we're talking about. Remember, it's delayed, right? But if it's a high fee. Um, yeah, but no, but he could double spend it with a high. No, no, fee. we don't. Yeah. Don't deal with that. That's wrong. Yeah. No, it's terrible. Uh, no. Um, well, it's on the it's on the diagram. <laughs> no, 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 no. Time lock back out, right? It's there. Yeah, yeah. Like in the previous diagram, if you have a promise UTXO, you have to put some kind of back out before it to make sure that if the guy double spends it, then at the very least we can assure that the people involved in this Coinjoin XT structure are going to get back the money that they had to start with. They don't lose any money. Now, of course, that's not quite good enough because would you go to all this trouble and then just have somebody just... That's annoying, right? Well, you can address that with several ways. For example, here, he's kind of, it's kind of addressed by the fact he's receiving money. Like, <laughs> he probably doesn't want to double spend that because this gives him two Bitcoins. So if he double spends it, he's not going to get the two Bitcoins. So I think that's a pretty good incentive. Other ways it could be incented is if the promise UTXO is coming from one of the parties who've funded, they could actually have a penalty in the time lock back out. But, I mean, maybe that's a detail. Um, what else is going on here, apart from these two payments? What's going on at the bottom? Now, I think this is the really important part. This is the main thing I wanted to tell you, actually. Yeah. So, what's going on at the bottom is uh, there's actually a, a, a channel splice. Now, I'm not sure if technically this is really possible. Almost certainly not today. But I think theoretically it makes sense. If Alice and Carol agree to do this, they could splice in an amount at the end of this chain into a channel... They could also open a dual-funded channel. It's the same thing. Maybe one of them is more practical than the other. Now, why would we want to do this? Imagine they've got this, this channel input here. Sorry, I wish I had a pointer. Like a channel input here. The, channel, the new channel, the now spliced in channel, has a larger capacity. Um, and they also get their, effectively their change outputs from the whole process starting from their original. If you work out the numbers, that's what, how much they get back. Yeah. Um, what might be the advantage, and this is a bit of a difficult question, but I'm sure somebody in the room can figure it out. Why might it be really cool to put a splice into a channel at the end of this construction? Why might that be valuable? I mean, we could, we could just have 
because the, the, in fact, Carol is owed 1.4 Bitcoin at this stage, and Alice is owed 1.1 Bitcoin. So they could just simply be paid 1.1 and 1.4, and everything would be normal. They've made their payments, they've gone through this structure, but why might it be useful to add in a splice into a channel? Anybody know? Um, let's have Ben, yeah. It's like similar to a pay join where you're hiding the amount each user receives. Yeah, it's hiding, it's, it, it's making, um, I'll, I'll just go straight to the point, because you, you're basically 100% correct, is it, it, it breaks subset sum analysis. I want to put it like that. Now, what's subset sum analysis? We, we covered it a bit with Max. It's the basic idea that in a transaction, if it's collaborative, if Alice is basically paying herself in the transaction and Bob is basically paying himself in the transaction, then you can kind of, like the shared coin thing, you can break you can break, figure out these inputs add up to th these outputs, these inputs add up to these outputs, and the whole thing ended up being more or less pointless, yeah? At least from a privacy perspective. Now, doing this, I mean, arguably the page I might have already screwed up <laughs> a little bit, but that's, that's more complicated. But this is really clear. Uh, so before I go on to the, yeah, let me go on to the like advantages I in a minute. Let's just talk about the subset sum. So that, <coughs> that structure had four inputs, what do I mean by inputs? I mean, think of the whole structure as one thing. Input, input, uh, input, input, yeah? Output, 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 output. No, have I missed one? Uh, one, two, three, four, five. But that, that would be distinct, yeah. Oh, I missed the 0 0.2, yeah, there's six outputs, yeah. So if we, if we look at the summary of that, yeah. Um, if you wanted to do subset sum analysis, you're looking for subsets of the inputs and subsets of the outputs. Now, in mathematics, that's called a power set. It's basically the set of all subsets, which ingeniously can be calculated by considering that each item is either in a subset or not in a subset, which means the number of subsets of n is 2 to the n minus 1 if you don't include the, the empty set. Um, so 2 to the 4 times 2 to the 6 is 2 to the 10. So you have about 1,000 uh, possibilities, a little bit less, but about 1,000 possibilities here. And basically none of them work. In other words, you can't find groups of those that add up to groups of those. That's, that's I just put it in English instead. <laughs> you can't find groups of the inputs that add up to the, the same number as groups of the outputs. And because, as Ben pointed out, by splicing a chunk of the money into a channel and dividing that money between the two participants in a way that's hidden on chain, you no longer have a subset sum solution. And just to really prove the point, that's it in Python. You can just like list all the subsets of the ins and outs. The only thing it returns is the actual full set of inputs and the actual full set of outputs. That is a valid solution, right? But that's the only one. There are no other valid solutions. Go on. This means you have to have either a pay join or a splice or both. You have to, I'll, I'll, tell, I'll be more specific. You have to have a payment from one of the participants to another one of the participants. But I'm not sure if that's enough, but that's definitely a necessary. I'm not sure if it's a sufficient condition uh -huh. to break subset sum analysis. And the, but but the, it's funny because the, the lightning channel one is like a weird twist on that idea where it's not the... It's not that there's a payment, it's just that like the, 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 it's th there's a split in one of the UTXOs which isn't exposed. I, I guess it's, that's a fundamentally different thing to a payment into participant. But if you have, page one has into participant, pay, pay, uh, uh, into participant payment, which is why, as, I, as you said correctly and I incorrectly corrected you yesterday, <laughs> um, a pay join does break subset sum. It's just, it's just uh, basically yes, let's keep it simple. A page on does break it because there's an inter-participant payment. Agreed? Does that make sense to you? Yeah. Yeah. And this, the same principle will definitely apply. But also, a lightning uh, channel can do the same thing because it's splitting funds without it being exposed on chain. And, and so, is there a qualitative difference between there's one inter-participatory payment versus yeah, two? That's, three, I was thinking five. about this the last couple of days. I haven't really like figured it out yet. I think that's a really interesting question. Like, could we get 10 people operating in this kind of structure and just have two of them paying each other and everyone else's stuff, subsets. I'm not, I think pr trivially no, right? Because let's say you've got A, B, C, D, right? And A is paying himself and B is paying himself. Now C is paying D. So A and B, clearly their, their amounts will add up, right? So that you won't have broken subset sum for A and B. 
It seems trivially that that's not... I, don't, I think there's a lot of little twists on this. Go on, uh, yeah, not, uh, nothing much to say, sorry, yeah. So the knapsack paper gives the uh, subtransaction model, right. or the subtransaction mapping model, and they, um, in there they assume the subtransactions map to zero, they don't model fees. If you right. generalize this and parameterize it by some delta, yeah. um, they make right, a, a tolerance, yeah. Yeah, they make an, a useful distinction between derived subtransaction mappings and non-derived subtransaction mappings. So you can think of, this of the non-derived ones as elementary. They're actually uh, finer grained, whereas the coarser grained ones that don't add additional information. Oh, um, you mean like like building, like you build multiple yeah. into a, a bigger one, yeah. The, the yeah. I remember that, I saw that in the paper, yeah, I remember, yeah. You, the, the trivial partition of everything together is always a valid solution. Yeah. And then the question is, uh, so qualitatively, are you breaking the assumption that a single subtransaction belongs to a single user? That's one mm -hmm. aspect of it. Mm -hmm. um, and you can still divide into subtransactions. It's just that the, the, the set of users that that subtransaction is attributed to is more than one entity. Okay. Uh, and secondly, yeah. there's the, the, the question of the, the tolerance of the amount. So, like, yeah, the tolerance is important, yeah. Yeah, so, so uh, both the, the fees um, complicate this a little bit, but yeah. the, specifically the, the pay join aspect or any sort of internal transfer within yeah. the transaction means that the adversary um, must have additional information. Then exactly. If yeah. that's, that's, that's my point of confusion with pay join, is if you're looking at it thinking, oh, that might be a pay join, then you come up with two solutions. But if you have no idea, you just look, there's no solution. Yeah. And even if you have a solution, the solution might attribute that part of the solution to two entities or more, right? So you have this, uh, I, I think that's a, the, the important qualitative distinction. Yeah. Okay, thanks. So. Um, um, clearly, this is a quite a, a thorny and a very interesting topic. I don't want to say it's like, oh, it's too complicated. It's actually really interesting to start thinking about this. Um, but I do want to come back and talk about the, tra the. Why am I even proposing such? Why am I even proposing such a weird design as that? Um, well, I guess I should ask you. I mean, maybe you just saw my slides. But what do you think might be the advantage? Uh, all this. Uh, it seems like a lot of hassle, right? Well, I mean, it, certainly in this way, it is a lot of hassle. There's multiple things going on. There's four people involved. One of them's not around, but. Uh, two of them are having to negotiate a bunch of multi-sig addresses. Um, why w do you, can you see, can anybody explain to me why, why this might be an interesting model? Right. So, so yeah, I think well, we can really, it's nice to have the diagram for this part, isn't it? Like if we look, for example, at that transaction there, well, what does it have? It has two inputs and two outputs. That's not very unusual, <laughs> right? That is, in fact, almost the most common structure. Yeah? Anything between one and three, maybe four inputs and two outputs. Vast majority of transactions are like that because that's what a payment looks like. Um, so that's nice. Uh, now, obviously, most of them have that kind of structure, but they're not all exactly the same. Like this one has three outputs, which is a little unusual, but it's not very unusual. Um, so it's a world of difference, right, from what we're thinking about equal output coin joins, whether it be join market, wasabi, or samurai, or anything else. That's the first point. What, what are the other possible advantages to this, to this structure? Max, Max seems to know. <laughs> He's on a roll, yeah. You, you don't even know when the tree starts or stops. Excellent, yeah. This, th this is, I think, the thing that I like the most about it, and um, that's why, if I can convince my mouse to work, uh, I do that, and then I do that. Excuse me for the low quality here, but <laughs> this, this was like the picture I used to illustrate the start of my blog post about this topic. Um, this is a bit more advanced than the blog, but you know, it's the same thing. So you know, there's some things happening in a bunch of transactions that are connected, but they're just part of this huge transaction graph on the blockchain. How is the blockchain analyst gonna know where to start? It's a huge, it's a completely different world from, from equal output coin joins. So that's probably the biggest advantage, I think, but... Um, but, okay, and, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to have an infinite amount of time, so I should just keep going. So, um, every transaction could be possibly interpreted as an ordinary spend, with the caveat that since many of these inputs are multi-sig, we need them to be not traditional multi-sig, not op check sig add in taproot, but specifically music style multi-sig, or at least, you know, aggregated multi-sig. Uh, so that's a kind of a big limitation, but it's possible today. Uh, the transaction negotiation can happen right at the start. Now, that is not an advantage over equal output coin join. 
A coin join traditionally involves a bunch of negotiation, signing and broadcast, right? Coin swaps and other steganographic solutions that are similar to coin swap often involve what I call cross-block interactivity because you have to fund and only when you're sure the funding event has, has occurred correctly can you then complete the protocol to complete a private coin swap. That's not really true with like a general atomic swap construct, maybe debatable, but you know, the proper private coin swap, it's kind of a, a cross-block interactivity and you have to worry about is that embedded deep enough in the chain? Because if it's not and it gets reorged, then theoretically I can lose some money in a coin swap. But this has the property, even though it's very complicated, there's a lot of signatures, a lot of keys, you can do all of it at one shot. And once you're finished, you never have to talk to your counterparty again. Because if they go offline, you've got all the pre-signed transactions. Um, maybe that's not too, uh, I didn't really have enough time. Um, Music 2 is required, or theoretically, or MUSIG anyway, or theoretically ECDSA with two-party computation. Anything that hides, to me, it's important to hide the fact that they're the multi-sig connectors between each of these transactions. Otherwise, they don't look like ordinary spends. And the last point is the point that we just said. The subgraph is not distinguishable. Okay, we talked about subset sum analysis. Uh, I'd also like to point out that subset sum analysis can fail in three ways. Maybe. <laughs> there are multiple subset sum solutions. We discussed this a little bit. Sometimes... Um, especially with larger transactions, not so much here, but with larger transactions, there might be multiple different subsets that add up to the same value on the other side. That's a brittle thing, and I think nothing much explained in great detail yesterday why it's brittle. We shouldn't rely on that, but it exists. The analyst cannot find the subgraph. That's the fantastic thing about this construct. There is an interparticipant payment, such as in PayJoin, that can break subset sum as well. Uh, I guess I should have added the Lightning as a separate one because it's not really the same thing as an interparticipant payment. In fact, it's just not. So there's a fourth one uh, on that list, which is Lightning, or I guess any second layer uh, commitment of funds. Arguably, the second is the most important. I think that's true. Um, all right. Some practical disadvantages uh, of doing that. First of all, you're going to have to like time lock. I'm claiming that when we look at this sequence of transactions that we pre-sign, we're going to have to put time locks on them. Why do we have to put time locks on them? Or why do I think we should put time locks on them? In other words, delay them. Yeah, they don't just... What, why should we delay the transactions? Yeah, because if there's like 10 of them and they all go on chain at once, then at least theoretically somebody who's watching is going to say, oh, look, that's... Well, in the future as well, not, not just in the part at the time. So, you know, timing correlation, it would be, it would be a bit crappy if we just broadcast them all at once. You could do that in an initial phase, just testing the idea out. But I think if you want a properly mature system using that, you're going to have to have delays. That's not very practical, is it? An associated problem is that means you're going to have to hold those pre-signed transactions and not lose them. Because if you lose them, you could lose money. So you're going to have to treat those pre-signed transactions as like private keys. Well, not private keys, but uh, you treat them as, as importantly as money that... It, it represents money for you. Um, so I claim that, that because of that, it might mean we do kind of need to take a ma make a model or at least some incentive model to get people to take part because I'm not just going to arbitrarily help you out to do one of those things and it takes me like six hours and I've got to hang on to and I've got to sign all this. No, pay me some money, please, yeah? So I think we do probably do need a market model at least a little bit f for that to work. Uh, sorry, aren't the time locks a uh, fingerprint as well? Uh, I, the good question, but I think not because we're going to join the anonymity set of uh, Electrum and Core and other wallets like Join Market who put the most recent block or the most recent block minus th three or whatever it is, you know? So we would just have to broadcast the transaction as soon as the time lock expires? I if we y wait a long time? So, so in the case where you're... Yeah, 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 yeah I've got you should definitely... Yeah, it would be a little bit, a little bit bad, to tr a little bit late. But I mean, that's not going to be a big deal. You're going to have to stay online, right, to broadcast them at those times. Well, yeah, um, that's a fair point that they could end up being a little bit delayed and therefore, theoretically, they look weird. Fair point, yeah, depending on if you're online or not. Um, Off-chain, on-chain privacy bleed is cool. Do, do, do people follow what I'm talking about there? That, that was a bit of a weird phrase I used there. So I was saying, remember at the end of the process, we, we spliced in some money into a channel in order to break subset sum. That's cool. That's off-chain to on-chain privacy bleed is what I call it, right? Because it, it, the, the, the privacy embedded in committing money into the channel gets bled through into the on-chain because the subset sum gets broken. It's cool, but it doesn't really work if the amount of money you put 
off-chain is 0.0001 BTC and the amount of money you're putting on-chain is 10 BTC because that is just a tiny delta in the subset sum analysis. Uh, nothing much, just mentioned tolerance. You know, you, you can put a little delta value in your subset sum and get more solutions and obviously it's going to come out. So I'm thinking like, I don't know, I'm top of my head, like 10%, uh, just checking the time here, 10%, um, maybe if the off-chain is like 10% of the on-chain, it's okay. Maybe if the off-chain is only like 1%, maybe it's not okay. Question? Yeah. Ah, good question. Good question. I, I remember thinking about this. Yeah. If you, if you, um, let's go back to the slide so we can explain it. So we had, remember, a, a splice in here. I mean, it's even better with splice, but let's say it was funding a channel, dual funding a channel, you know, and Alice put in 0 0.02 and Carol put in 0 0.03, and then what, a month later, they close the channel and, you know, zero point. Well, but the nice thing is even if they do that, we don't know for sure that they didn't have payments going through the channel in the meantime. So I, I think the worst case would be you put the money into a lightning channel, then you immediately remove it. Then it's kind of stupid because you can just assume that they didn't have any payments in the meantime routed through it or, or payments they made. Uh, yeah. So, but gen in the general case, you can reasonably say that as long as that channel is long living, we could plausibly assume some amount of TXs went through it. But very good question. I had the same question myself, yeah, um, when I first, yeah. Um, sorry if I'm, I keep moving the mic. I'm, I'm, I'm terrible at this. Uh, so now I know, I know we all, we're all, we're all uh, hungry and um, probably tired as well, yeah. And that's why I'm now going to give you a really dense piece of mathematics. <laughs> <laughs> So in order to have uh, uh, this, I mentioned I think we need a market for this because there's delays and so we have a coordination issue because people don't really want to do it. Well, today we have kind of liquidity markets. I, I can't remember when I found these years ago. Uh, just this joint market order book is a market. You know, this is some lightning terminal thing, whatever. There are liquidity markets. There's liquidity ads. There's all these markets, right? So we're used to the idea that we can like uh, advertise to request liquidity and offer a payment for that service of liquidity. The problem here is, as I mentioned, on-chain fees in CoinJoin and join market are a real problem. So, like, uh, you do a simple coin join on um, a single coin join on join market, you're exposing almost certainly your input value because you're paying a fee to the to the makers, um, and that fee is deducted. And when you look at the the subset sum analysis, you try and oh, that's the input size, that's the output size. The difference is the fee. Oh, he obviously paid a fee. So unfortunately, a single coin join in join market doesn't give you what you would really want. What you would really want is that the receiver of the funds doesn't know where they came from, right? Or at least that's one thing you would want. You don't really get that because there's this on-chain fee thing. So we want this fee to be off-chain, but that's a bit tricky. And I'm going to propose a way to solve that problem, make the fee be off-chain so nobody sees it. Uh, so I'm kind of glossing over the text here. Uh, yeah, so, yeah. Uh, good question. I didn't really think about it. I suppose you could either take that approach that some people take of making everyone contribute equally to the mining fee, or you could embed it in this as well. I think both are, make sense, don't they? Let's say. Um, oh, let's say it's a, let's say it includes mining fee just for simplicity, all right? Because it's just a, it's just another number to add into the fee. In the end of the day, I mean, I know there's different ways to do it. So crudely, my proposed solution is this. So if you don't understand all the mathematics, maybe you can understand the basic flow is basically the taker is going to send, uh, you, uh, there's a con construct called a HODL invoice, maybe it's a stupid name, but the general idea is like the sender constructs the, uh, the payment hash and then the, um, the receiver constructs, or the, they, they construct the, the invoice such that when, like the, the example given is pizza delivery, right? So when you deliver the pizza, or the merchant delivers the pizza, uh, they can request the pre-image from the payer to unlock the invoice. So there's a more of a, like an atomicity between the sender receiving the goods for the payment and the payment actually being enacted. So you kind of set up the, the route, you know, you set up the HTLCs and everything, but they don't get unlocked until that moment when the, the sender res, uh, reveals the pre-image. There we go. <laughs> so the idea here is that the taker sends, let's say, an elliptic curve point now, this requires PTLC, so bad news. This particular part of my presentation requires something that doesn't exist yet, unlike MUSIC2, which theoretically, or MUSIC, which theoretically does. 
Um, but this requires PTLC because you have to pay to a point, right? And then uh, you set up the HTLCs. When the maker uh, does what is required of him, which is to say sends all the signatures and all the transactions and the multi-sigs that I've just shown you, then uh, the taker will send, uh, will, bro it will broadcast the transactions, thus revealing his signature. And the trick of it is that his, reveal his revealing a signature will be able uh, to be matched up with the adapter signature or signature adapter that uh, the taker produced originally on the Schnorr signature, on his partial Schnorr signature in the multisig. Um, and so that, what that results in is that the maker receives the pre-image for the invoice atomically with the broadcast of the funding transaction. I'm going to expand, expand on that because uh, when I first came up with this idea, I thought, well, that's cool. And then I realized there's actually a really big problem with it. <laughs> but yeah, go on. Ben. If you don't have um, PTLCs on Lightning Net, couldn't you yeah. just do a PTLC on-chain? Um, I don't know what you mean. Like, you, like if you have, like, you just do like a point time lock contract literally on, on an on-chain yeah, but, payment. Uh, but we, we were trying to create off-chain fees to avoid having a fingerprint on-chain. Uh, okay, yeah, yeah. We did, the fundamental goal here is an off-chain fee, yeah. Okay. But other than that, your idea is excellent. It just doesn't <laughs> actually solve the problem I'm trying to solve. It solves another problem. <laughs> but a good point, though. Yeah. Um, so yeah, Schnorr. So this is where the, the pro uh, let me first explain why it doesn't work. What I've just said doesn't actually work, and the reason it doesn't work is because we have more than one maker. If we had only one maker, it would work fine. This works fine in a two-party sense. You could imagine. Um, I really need a pointer. You could imagine. Um, each maker setting up the invoice to an elliptic curve point capital Q plus some offset that they choose. And then the taker will send the adapter signature. And I don't really have time to explain adapter signatures. I'm sure a lot of people have heard of it and a lot of people don't really understand it because it's not something that people talk about much. But the basic idea is you can swap a signature for a secret value. If I can like, boil it down to one thing, it's that. You can swap a signature for a secret value. So the, the, the taker sends this adapter signature, which is verifiable, verifiably like corresponding to their funding transaction multisig. And once the maker sees that, he knows that when the signature is broadcast on train, chain, he'll be able to subtract his partial signature in the multisig and subtract the adapter signature he was sent and get the corresponding secret queue. So I'm not going to explain all the notation here because I haven't got time. Um, uh, tilde means aggregated value. Uh, subscript T means taker. This is the private key. So this is like a Schnorr signature but with part of the nonce missing. The, the part that's missing is the queue. So basically he gets the secret value queue once the transaction is broadcast on chain. So it's atomic, it's trustless. Now why doesn't that work? Well, it does work if there's only one maker. If there's multiple makers, um, yeah, he uses Q to settle the lightning invoice. If there's multiple makers, it doesn't work because what's broadcast on chain is the total signature sigma. If you have three people making a mu sig, they're going to have three partial signatures. So each maker is going to see the total. Um, well, I, sh I did this the wrong way around. He's, he's not going to be able to subtract. Yeah, he's not going to be able to subtract his partial signature and the other maker's partial signature to get the taker's partial signature unless the other maker cooperates with him, which is certainly possible, but it's not something you can depend on, right? Because the other maker could be colluding with the taker. So fundamentally, uh, it doesn't work, but it does because I figured it out. Because I actually wrote a, um, a blog post years ago, uh, just completely off the top of my head. Uh, I thought, I had no idea, it didn't seem remotely practical, but I thought you can kind of do this adaptive signature trick with multiple people at the same time. So what you can do is this. Um, I'll, just, I'll just say it. I'm sorry. It's I know. Um, imagine two makers. We're going to make a mu sig, three of three mu sig. We have an aggregated P, P ag aggregate. We each have our own nonce. We use uh, three round mu sig and not mu sig two because it's a bit simpler to analyze in this case, but I think it would work the other way as well. Three round mu sig. We're going to send uh, commitments to our nonce values uh, in the first round. We're also going to send commitments to our adapter secret value. So the trick here is everyone has their own adapter secret, not just one person. We're going to send commitments to uh, what is it here? the adapter values, adapter secret points, and the nonces. Then they get revealed. 
then we find the aggregated nonce, we've got the aggregated nonce, the aggregated key, and the trick is that let's say if you're index two, you make your lightning invoice uh, payment hash, which is actually a point, payment point, be the sum of the adapter points of the other two parties. Because that, you're, yeah. And if you're, if you're index three, if you're the, the other maker at index three, you'll make your payment point for your lightning invoice be the sum of the adapter points of the other two people. So what I realize is that there's, you can't make this take and make a, a distinction in this construction, actually, because everyone could be colluding against you. You have to make it so that uh, you use basically everyone else apart from you as your counterparty. And linearity makes that work. <coughs> because if... Um, which one am I? Uh, so each party makes their own partial, uh, makes their own adapter. So everyone has to send an adapter to everyone else, which is corresponding to their own adapter secret QI. And they all share those around. And adapters are verifiable. So each person can verify that the adapter signatures from all the other parties are correct. When everyone's satisfied, any one person in the group can send their partial signature first. So if, if index three sends his partial signature first, it looks like that. Notice it refers to all of the adapters, but he only includes his own secret there. And then I guess you'll just have to trust me because it will be way too complicated to explain. But basically he will, any person will be able to s uh, subtract um, their own full partial signature, which is to say their partial signature, which is not including an adapter, and then subtract the adapter signatures from the other parties, and the result will be the sum of the adapter secrets which are not theirs. And that's what they already decided was the pre-image for their lightning invoice. Uh, should I really have done this, a presentation about this? <laughs> Yeah, I, I remember when I had this idea, I, I, I ran it by, by Andrew Polster on IRC, and he was like, yeah, that's really cool. And I realized that, you know, this is unfairly linear signatures for the win. You know, it's, it's like, it's the linearity that makes it work, because without that linearity, you couldn't do that. But you're exactly right. It pretends that everyone else is one counterparty by adding them all up. The only caveat I'll say is, when you do stuff like this in cryptography, you have to be really careful. Because the thing is, um, what happens if somebody tries to adversarially create their adapter point? And, and the, the way I believe, I, I, I should try and like write a paper about it or something, because I believe if you, just like in music, three round music, what they do is they commit to all the R points up front, and that allows them to then just simply use the line linearity and add them without worrying that the other party has subtracted something weird and like, you know. But I think the same thing would, would apply with these adapter secrets. If you just send hashes to them up front, I don't, there's no possible way somebody could manipulate their T, uh, Q values to screw you over. I, I believe that's right. I, don't, I hate that that's, that's on, on a video, because if I'm wrong, I'm going to look like an idiot. <laughs> Exactly, yeah, or anything, yeah. Um, so um, this being three round, I think, is not problematic at all because we're all going to have mul already going to have multiple rounds of sharing keys and sharing signatures on transactions. Whereas, you know, why does Music 2 exist? It was a h huge feat of engineering, but it existed because they had specific use cases in mind where boiling it down to two or even only one round of interaction was actually very important, such as hard certain hardware wallet scenarios. Uh, but if you don't care about that, or like I don't, then... I I'm just like right now I'm writing music, three round music in Python and it's, it's easy, right? Because it's not that complicated. I mean, you just have to make sure you aggregate the keys properly because you have key subtraction attacks both on the keys and on the nonces, so you have to be careful about that. Anyway, blah, blah, blah. Yes? What if two of the makers like, collaborate? Yeah. Yeah. So this is design. Well, actually, if you're talking about the, the taker here is the one paying money and he, um, what would they, what, 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 what danger, danger are you seeing here? Yeah, but that's what I was just talking about to Lisa, is the fact that if you commit to the inputs to the adapter up front, which is to say the adapter point and the nonce, then it's impossible for you to manipulate those values 
based on the other person's uh, values. Right. So you're, you're thinking if if the two make it uh, Q values were somehow manipulated. Yeah, it's possible. That's why I really, uh, I'm not quite sure. I'll have to think about that. that that's, I'll think about that one. That's an interesting point. Yeah, I don't know. I don't think there's an issue there, but I, don't, I, I couldn't tell you for sure. Hmm. I, I'm, I'm not sure what you would, anyway, let's not get into that now because I don't have an answer. Um, okay, we're running out of time. Hang on. Where's my phone gone? There it is. Oh, it's not too bad. Okay, I mean, feel free to have lunch if you want, but it's only 12.40, so I'll, I might talk a little bit longer. Um, yeah, obviously going through all this maths is kind of, I mean, it, maybe you've had a whiteboard, but and, yeah, anyway, who wants to do that? People don't like maths. Uh, so sales, let me sort of summarize what I'm saying here. Sales pitch, because, you know, uh, I'm, a, I'm a terrible salesman, and I admit it, but, uh, you know, sometimes you want to sell something a little bit. Um, a market solution to coordination, I think most people in this room saw, saw, at least sort of agree that that is like the right way to solve coordination, yeah? Obviously, you can use central coordinators. Obviously, there's advantages, but markets are cool, <clears throat> especially with this kind of thing. No on-chain footprint. That refers to this PTLC construction, which unfortunately we can't do today. And anyway, how practical is it? You know, setting up this lightning invoice in advance. I mean, you know, lightning payments fail. Uh, so I don't exactly know what we do about that. Any ideas? <laughs> I mean, we, you know, we atomically set up this invoice, and then you try and pay it, and then... I mean, uh, well, the reasonable question is... <laughs> the, the failure would be before the route reaches the receiver. It, and the HODL invoice only goes into effect when the receiver re receives the route. Oh, yeah, you've already set it up. That's yeah. true. You, you, if, if you weren't able to route it to start with, then it wouldn't... Yeah, and then that, I mean, I am completely clueless about this stuff, but I know that things like HODL invoices are a bit of a problem in Lightning, right? Because you're, you're locking things up, and then there's a question of how... But that closely ties into my other area of interest, which is how do we allow people to get paid appropriately for the actual resources being used, which includes time and not Jeez. just money, right? Um, so I think that's a whole other discussion, but it's certainly... But a good point. I, I wasn't thinking clearly. There's not really an issue with the routing thing because you've already done it, yeah. We could still fail, though, right? It could still fail, I mean, yeah. after the event. There's a timeout, yeah. That's another thing. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, certainly this whole idea of the off-chain payment of fees is, I won't say, it's partly speculative, but I, I think it kind of makes sense, at least in broad outline. Um, the steganographic, I hope by now everyone understands what we're talking about, just the fact that you can't, they, a lot of these things look like payments and you can't distinguish the whole like set on the blockchain. I think it will, re if anybody, it, it's maybe a sci-fi, but if people actually start us using stuff like this, chain analysis will be really, really hard. I mean, oh, another, th another element, you've got like 10 transactions in a, in, a, in a list, but what if they're all like, Electrum style transactions, you know, what if they're all using the same wallet fingerprints? So I think part of it should be Randomized wallet fingerprints because you don't want them all to, to have anything about them that look the same Otherwise, I mean it'll still be hard for them, but they might be able to figure out um, And last one is just a minor thing is just the fact that you can do the whole negotiation right at the start Which I think is a very important property um, Though that's my sales pitch for SDMC Which um, is a thing But I think uh, the other thing uh, you know, unless... Uh, uh, yeah, maybe there's questions now. I'll stop there. Questions, yeah. Uh, I, was, I was just curious, sorry if we already covered this, but is there a way to lock the makers into a fee rate? Is that designed? You mean the Bitcoin network fee rate? Uh, yeah, because I'm just imagining, like, if I'm a maker, yeah. I could, like, um, publish the transaction that allows me to get the pre-image, but at a really low fee, so it never gets mined. Publish a transaction that allows me to get the fee image... No, but the, 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 the transaction that allows you to get the pre-image is the funding transaction, which is a multi-sig, so both parties are signing off on that. Oh, right, and the, uh, the taker publishes it, right? Is that right? Anyone can publish it. It's a multi-sig, so whoever finishes first, I mean, whoever wants it to... Go. The, the idea with this structure is that anyone, once all the... Let's say all the transactions after the funding get signed in advance, and they're all based on a multi-sig. Once all of those are signed in advance... That means everyone's agreed, and so they both co-sign the funding transaction, which kicks it off. Um, I've forgotten the question now. <laughs> oh, I was just talking about fee it, it sounds like what you're saying is that they, they're only signing it once they see the fee rates. There's no concern like that. Well, they'd have to agree on the fee rates to sign it, I think is what I'm saying. 
It's a transaction. Okay, I'm getting right. odd from Lisa, so I'm probably right. <laughs> cool. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, I know it's like a bit of a weird concept. What happens if the fee rate changes between when you've signed, pre-signed all the transactions? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a good question. Somebody asked that back, back in the day about CoinJohn XT. They said, what about the fee rates? Yeah. So could we... Yeah, there's RBF, but there's, there's, well, there's, there's, there's pre-signing multiple versions, which is not unreasonable, although I, ugh, that's a lot of data, but I don't think it will be that hard, um, maybe. Depends where you're talking, I suppose. Um, multiple fee rates is one reasonable solution if you can't come up with a better one. Can anyone come up with a better one? So we pre-sign all these transactions, and then suddenly the mempool just spikes. You know, uh, can, we, can we just reply? Uh, Child we pays for RPF parent. Hmm? Child pays for parent, presumably in another yeah, we could do that, XT. right. Especially if it was just like a one-line thing. It would be particularly easy, just the last one. Well, I guess. We could, we could, what was that? I was just saying you could delete the mempool. Delete the mempool, nice. Yeah, yeah. Who, who, whose meme was that? I've forgotten, yeah. Um, okay. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, I remember now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember now. That was, that was interesting. Um, but no, I think that's, a, that's an important practical point which I kind of glossed over, but I don't think it should stop it from working. But it, it does connect to another point, which is this whole thing about timing. Like, will people be comfortable with doing these kind of structures that take hours? Now... I showed a kind of a, you know, paradise version where everything's perfect and somebody gets to do a pay join and somebody gets to splice into a channel or somebody gets a payment. But does Bob, mi Bob might have to wait six hours for that payment because I don't want to broadcast all those transactions right at once. So are we really going to have like external payments in those structures? Maybe not. Maybe mostly it'll be my, more like what CoinJoin is today where a lot of people are getting together and maybe there's a market, you know, some people get paid a fee. That's why I was really keen on the idea of de designing an off-chain fee uh, element to it because I think... I mean, in theory, you could apply that same idea to join market. It's just unfortunate we don't have PTLCs yet. They're very powerful. And this is a very good example to me of why they're powerful. You know, people talk about breaking the correlation in the route, which is great and everything. But, you know, there's, you can swap signatures for secrets. It's really powerful. Right? <laughs> um, yeah. And contrarily to single transaction coin joints, there's a backup problem as well. Right. Well, you, yeah. The, the, uh, one of the disadvantages we listed was you have to treat these pre-signed transactions as... Well, as money. Not necessarily as secrets, of course. Yeah, but that's the other thing. They're not secret, even though they are money. So you could have like a watchtower kind of design. No, not, when there wouldn't literally be a watchtower because it's not watching. It's just somebody could be doing that job on your behalf if you could trust them with your privacy. But other than that, I mean, at the end of the day, storing some transactions isn't that much harder than storing some private keys, and it's only very temporary. So it's definitely a problem, but it's not, I think, a There's just no hierarchical deterministic way of backing it up contrarily with keys, right? True. Yeah, good point. Yeah, that's, that's worse than keys for sure, yeah. Unless, uh, well, actually, the, these time lock backouts are interesting in this, though, aren't they? Because, no, no, I don't think there's any. No, it's a good point, yeah. It's more difficult. You do have to store that data, but only for a short period, to be fair. It's not like, you know. Any other questions? I'm I'm so good at I'm so good at marketing, aren't I? Uh, uh, yeah, well, I could, I could just tell you, but I, I I think you're trying to write it down. That's why I'm finding. Yeah. You you went your backronym, so great. Yeah. <laughs> no, but well, this is not unfortunate. Yeah, I need a backronym. Yeah, somebody give me a backronym, please. Um, any more questions? Uh, did you compare the, the block size, block space? Oh, thank you for mentioning that because I forgot to mention it. I, I think one of, the, one of the other advantages of this construction is that I think... Now, this is a really tricky point. We talked both yesterday and today about k-anonymity, the idea of measuring anonymity quantitatively, saying there's this number of people who have the same role or action in this event, and therefore, you know, there's a k-anonymity of 10 or 100 or something. It doesn't apply, in my opinion, at least not in any way that I understand, to a steganographic style of privacy-preserving technology. I mean, you could argue with like a coin swap, at least the naive form of coin swap involves equal amounts. So even if the transactions are disconnected, they have a fingerprint that tells you that they're connected somehow and therefore you can start saying there's N people doing these swaps. But here, you don't have any idea. Um, if the, the blockchain analysis can't even find it, and then if somehow he finds certain parts of it, um, how does he decide how many people were involved. Um, it's, it's tricky. I'm sure there are certain cases you could show of this kind of structure where 
actually the privacy isn't that good, but I think generally speaking, I could argue that in the limit, it has the anonymity set of the entire blockchain. In the limit, because it's trying to behave exactly like the rest of the blockchain. Uh, but that's only in the limit, that's not in the reality. Uh, why did I say that? You, you actually asked a slightly different question, but I thought it was connected. You said... Um, it, 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 my other question would have been how to quantify privacy, which you answered, but the, yeah. the other question is how does it compare block space-wise? Yeah, yeah, the efficiency of block space. That's, do, you see what, do you see why I think it's connected, right? Because, yeah. because if you need a quantitative measure like 100, you need to have a lot of people... Well, debatable. You, I know you've got a lot of very sophisticated ideas about like efficiency within your construction uh, of block space usage. But in principle, this might apply to CoinSwap, but I think it certainly applies to this construction. But it's, I would argue it's very efficient in block space because you get a quality of anonymity which is difficult to measure, but which arguably is much higher for, for a per unit of transaction. Yeah, it's arguably, it's very arguable, I agree. <laughs> you it's, know, it's difficult to compare. Yeah, we, we, would, yeah. we would love to have... Uh, I'm just going to pretend it's the whole block... The, the anonymity set is the whole blockchain, and somebody's going to have to tell me why it isn't. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Entropic model, right? Entropic. You explained the entropic model yesterday. Very good point. Yeah. Yeah. So, like in this case, the anonymity set would be potentially huge. Like whatever yes. time window of uh, value compatible transactions. Yes. But then there's two very difficult open questions. If you try to model the adversary, um, three. Uh, okay. So. <laughs> um, this model assumes the adversary can assign a probability for guessing, um, and what probability it assigns is you know, debatable. Yeah. Um, tacitly, this perspective assumes that the adversary is uh, truth-seeking and rational, w which might not be the case. Like we, we have very good evidence to believe that chain analytics companies are um, in yeah. the profit of selling narratives. Yeah, that's a whole other can of worms. Yeah, I agree, so but I'm not sure we can um, <laughs> go down that road now. And finally, there's no answer for like the entropic model, at least mm. as in the paper that I was uh, referencing, uh, assumes a single point of origin. Mm. And even that is prohibitively expensive to like actually calculate in most situations. Right. Right. We don't need to calculate it. We really want lower bounds on the entropy. Mm -hmm. That's good enough, mm -hmm. but I see, yeah. um, nonetheless, the uh, entropy oh, yeah. that you would have to calculate for this is like a joint entropy over the power set of all potential points <laughs> of origin, and that's an exponentially sized object. Yeah. So, like, and it's yeah, it's very difficult questions. Yeah, which is great, right? It's, it's so difficult. That's great. Well, well I, it would be, I agree. It would be nice if we could have a really clean model that said there's a specific, you know, as you say, lower bound of entropy or some even simpler model of k-anonymity set, but I, I, I don't know. All, all I'm trying to do in this is trying to expand what I, I think is already uh, trivially existent, which I think Max mentioned earlier this morning is uh, Satoshi's are in... Uh, Bitcoin is intrinsically fungible. It's just not very fungible at all in practice. It's really, really difficult to get any real practical fungibility, but intrinsically it's completely fungible. It, it's just, uh, you know... So this is trying to expand on the the real intrinsic nature as a, uh, we'll see. Okay, I should probably stop because, you know, otherwise we'll, we need to eat, right, so. <laughs> yeah, let's start in like five minutes, so it's down oh, on the first floor for anyone's that. Um, one thing that I think is kind of cool about this sort of thing, and this is like sort of maybe yeah, more of a know. social commentary than anything like um, necessarily technical, but it's cool mm -hmm. that like, I mean, I think coin joins in general are like this idea where Bitcoiners have to come together to like, we, like it's like you have to work together as a team to like keep your privacy, which is kind of cool. Um, this, it seems like is a little more, your teams can be like a little smaller size, so to speak, than in larger coin joins. That's a, that's a good point I didn't really mention. I, I showed these examples with two people just because it's easier to, to draw the diagram. Yeah. Uh, you can do this with 10. I was, I was talking, I think, to no para the other week about, you know, what happened if we tried to do Wasabi with like, more people using a coin join XT structure. And one of the things that I wrote in my response to him, and he agreed with me, was this is so fragile though. If you try to do 100 people with this kind of structure, oh yeah, sure, we've got back out. So we're definitely going to hit the back out path, right? Because one person out of 100 is going to screw something up before you. Well, that's if you use promise. I suppose you could argue that, anyway, it's a complicated question. Um, but the point is that um, with large numbers of people, yeah, everything's complicated. I'm sorry about that. With, with uh, larger numbers, I mean, let's be more concrete. With a large, let's say 100, 100 people, right? We're going to pre-sign all these transactions, and then we're going to have 100 of 100 multi-sig starting the whole thing off, right? Uh, 
obviously the, the, the most likely thing is that somebody's going to fail to respond somewhere during this signing process, then the whole thing doesn't even start. And nothing's, we've just lost time. But the, 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 the real question is this, right? If you use a structure with a realistic chance of something going wrong, like a promise you text, or like a malicious adversary is just like wants to block, jam the process, it just has, if they're there, they're going to block everything that comes after that promise, and everyone else is going to have to fall back to the time lock. So I feel like very large sets of people can do this fine, but it's more limited. Because without these alternative inputs, this structure is a lot, well, it's less kind of impressive, I feel like. Because if it only has one entry point, it's more plausible to me intuitively that there'll be ways to identify it as such. Maybe that's just a bit too vague, but... So yeah, large, but I agree with your original point, which is we can do this with smaller groups of people and get a real effect, which is what I had in my mind, like three, four people. Yeah. Um, no more? I think we should, oh, one more. Wh what's the privacy punishment for the fallback time block? Yeah, good question. Yeah, that's a good question. What, what's the, how much do we lose in terms of the fallback? Um, it seems to me, Seems to me debatable. Um, thinking about only small groups, it makes it a bit kind of easy, right? Because then this might have like two or three outputs and then it wouldn't look strange. So we could just have dump everything out in one transaction. Um, we could theoretically make the time locks themselves be trees if we need to make them less. But that's kind of annoying, so probably wouldn't do that. So I think that's a, that's a good example where if you had a lot of people, it might be worse, wouldn't it? Because if you, if you want the time lock to be one payout for everyone, it will look very, very distinct. That's a good point which I hadn't thought about, yeah. Uh, there's definitely trade-offs with using large numbers of people with this, which in practice you would probably avoid by using small groups, I think. And so if the adversary knows that a certain uh, tree is a coin join XT. Right, so if, they, if we assume the adversary knows this exists, uh -huh. yeah. yeah. I, then the anonymity set is just uh, the fresh Bitcoin that entered the tree in that time period. The anonymity set of what, though? One, one specific output? It's really, it's really slippery, isn't it? But it's, yeah. it's a good point to consider. We should definitely consider that, but I think it's... Uh, like the, p the point I'm trying to clear. make is that I if the adversary doesn't know that this is CoinJoin XT, yeah. yes, the anonymity set is huge. Mm -hmm. But yeah, yeah. Uh, just like with PageJoin, right? But if he does know yeah. it's this is CoinJoin XT, then it seems... It decreases the anonymity sets of... Well, it must be, by definition. Yeah. He, he knows more information, right? Him and yeah, yeah I, 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 I'm not sure how easy to quantify it, but, but it should therefore be a fairly tractable problem, at least. It would reduce it more to a existing blockchain and analysis on more normal flows, I guess, mm -hmm. which you know, may or may not be easy, depending on the structure. I mean, this is a very simple structure. I think we can make... Well, we can make lots of structures. Is there an mm -hmm. optimal structure? Yeah, I wish... I mean, I... I I think I'm a bit too lazy to actually try and do this <laughs> analysis. No, because that kind of analysis is hard, and I, yeah. I don't know. I prefer thinking about long equations with sigmas in them. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't like that, that kind of, yeah, it's is, hard. Is there a civil attack problem here? Yeah, which is why we need a market and we're why we need, well, well, this is why we need, actually, the remaining 20 slides of my presentation, which <laughs> I'm not, <laughs> I mean, I can start now if you want, but uh, <laughs> I think you're probably hungry, right? We might have time for more. So the hackathon will start at three, but there's always the option. We have some like breakout space and stuff if mm -hmm. we want to continue conversation. Um, so th does this kind of like reduce the post mix like tooling needed to like basically just like a normal wallet, like no like unmixed change kind of uh, failure things you can have like a, with a normal coin join? I mean, I think the simple answer is yes, but uh, there's probably a complicated answer as well. Like my, my intuition is... It, it probably depends on the structure you choose yeah. here, right? My intuition would be that it's like the same as like if you just n use normal privacy practices if you never coin joined. Because you're kind of... Yeah, which is yeah. already hard actually. Yeah, but, yeah. but yeah, absolutely. I, I know what you mean, yeah. But don't forget also we could mix and match here. We can we can make these kind of structures with the equal out coin joins as well. So that makes it even more complicated. I don't know how to think about that. If you want to do that, you can do that as well. I mean, But yeah, I agree with your, your analysis, yeah. Yes, I would love to. Where, where should I share them, though? Is there, is there, oh, in the Telegram group. I'll, I'll share them in the Telegram group, yeah. Um, okay. <laughs>